you know, I really live my life and so much of my life in solution, right? Of like, yeah. how do we get to that solution? Uh, so much so that sometimes it can be a little difficult. My friends will get frustrated with me. They're like, can we just spend a minute being really sad and spend a minute being like, okay, I hate myself, whatever. But my, my personality is so solution oriented because again, like I know help exists for everyone, for everything. And we just have to get you in the room. Once you're in the room, healing is possible. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Carter Barnhart, CEO and co-founder of Charlie Health, and you're watching Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Hey everyone, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another episode of the show. Carter, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I usually ask my guests, how did you get this job? Oh, I feel like this job found me. Um, I have spent my whole life in behavioral health. You know, before I even knew that my life was going to be behavioral health. I was a patient of behavioral health services and unfortunately struggled as a teenager. Uh, I grew up outside of Philadelphia, amazing, intact family that did everything to support me. But unfortunately, when I was 14 years old, I was raped at a concert um, and afterwards struggled with anxiety and depression. And my parents spent countless years trying to find me the right treatment. And they eventually did when I was 17 years old and it saved my life. Um, and after that, I became obsessed with helping other people and ensuring that everyone knew that treatment existed. I started as an intern at a very small rehab um, and for the past 11 years have been working on the front lines with high risk patients and helping them find behavioral health treatment, uh, which has been an incredible journey. Wow. Um, I thank you for sharing that. I'm so sorry that happened. Um, I can't imagine how traumatic, devastating that is. Um, I want to go back in the chronology a little bit. Um, yeah. back to what you were thinking maybe as a little girl growing up like what did you want to be when you grow up because these the choices that we make in our career or whatnot you know it's I'm always curious of how we make those choices um, so can we take it back just a little bit and talk to me about what you were thinking um, maybe yeah. you know were you wanting to be an astronaut or a firefighter or you know a, a banker on Wall Street or you know what were your thoughts so my mom likes to say that I came out of the womb screaming. Um, I have been a fierce advocate my whole life. And so growing up, everyone told me I would make a great lawyer. And so that's just what I always thought I would be. Uh, I liked arguing for what I believed was right and fair. And as a kindergartner, I either wanted to be a lawyer or an investment banker because that's what I knew successful people did. Um, and <laughs> in my job today, I'm certainly not an investment banker. Um, but you know, there's a big piece of advocacy that we do. Uh, I learned that you didn't that more than just lawyers could be advocates. Um, and yeah, I think there's a little touch of that in the work I do today. Yeah. What did your parents do? Uh, my dad developed real estate, uh, and my mom worked in fashion. And and were you in that Philly area your entire life, basically? I was, yeah. And my dad, growing up, uh, developed low-income housing. And he used to say to me that the greatest gift in life was to make good and do good. That he had the ability to help people and then also help his family. And I really struggled as a, you know, like 12 year old, 13 year old, 14 year old, because I knew I didn't want to work in real estate. And I didn't know what my job was going to be where I could help people and also be able to have a family and be able to take care of, you know, it, my responsibilities in life. Uh, and today I, I have the opportunity to do that, which is incredible. Are you an only child or do you have siblings? I have a younger brother. His name's Grant. He is an incredible human who lives out in California. Okay, so, and uh, I'm always curious. So I'm an older, I'm, I'm the oldest child in my family. And um, we who, you know, come first tend to be, I don't know, we set the tone in many ways. Sometimes we, yeah. we, we grow up fast or we are like instant leaders. Sometimes we have to be a surrogate parent to a younger sibling. That's always interesting to me, that dynamic. Uh, you know, I've, I've always had a lot of ambition just out of the womb, you know. Um, I don't know if I'm an overachiever, probably underachieving right now, but um, I've at least had a lot of ambition to, to start and do things. So 
Um, and did you go to school? Did you, what path did you pursue with schooling? I did, yes. It's funny, when you were saying the thing about the older child, my brother used to joke growing up that the only thing worse than having one intense mom was having an intense mom and an intense sister who thought she was your mom. Um, because I was super, super involved in my brother's life growing up. I still am. Uh, and a little bit of that like helicopter sister. Uh, and I certainly paved the way for him. I also you know, made a lot of mistakes and he got to see what not to do a lot more than what to do, uh, which hopefully helped him avoid some of the same mistakes that I made. Uh, I, I really, though, I think part of my identity, when I think of how I define myself, one of my key characteristics is definitely an older sister. It's something that I take a lot of pride in. I love being an older sister and really loved that relationship with my brother. Yeah, that's super relatable. I, I, I feel the same way. Um, sometimes that hypervigilance, though, it takes, <laughs> it kicks into a, a gear that is not always appreciated, right? Uh, you uh, feel free to have them on next. And you can tell you how just not appreciated it is at times. <laughs> how many years apart are you guys? Uh, we're about two years apart. Okay, so yeah, I mean. His least okay. favorite thing that I do is I look on Find My Friends sometimes and I'll randomly text him and be like, hey, why have you been at the dog park for longer than two hours? Are you safe? He's like, Carter, I'm 28. I don't really need you checking on my physical whereabouts. But it's that it's that older kid instinct, right? Uh, but yeah, he checks on me too, which is nice. That's the great part about as you grow up, right? Like you take care of your younger siblings growing up. And then as you both become adults, that relationship shifts. And now he has things that he checks in with me on, uh, which is really nice to see. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's so great to have siblings who have got your back and who you can kind of feel like, maybe a, I feel a little bit of sense of purpose, I guess, you know, um, and pride in, in being a caregiver or, you know, at least being their uh, support system for my sisters. So it's super relatable. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, uh, and I'm curious, has he pursued a different path? What's his path? He has. He works in finance. Um, okay. You know, growing up, we used to think that he was the shy child. Uh, and I learned that he's actually not shy. It just is that I'm really not shy. And so when I was in the room, I would take up all the space in the room. Um, and I recently was with his friends who were all saying to me that he, he, he was like his most persuasive, outgoing, passionate friend. And I was like, wow, growing up, I guess I just took up all the energy, right? Um, <laughs> and he now is, he just finished business school, actually. Um, which he was in California for. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, it's curious. That, I don't think that family dynamic can be underestimated. It's, it's somewhat predictable, although, you know, we're all different. Um, there's a nature and a nurture component to all of it. But it fascinates me because sometimes it, it can be kind of prescri uh, predictive and prescriptive, I guess, if you, um, if you extrapolate, you know, just from, from the past uh, I think it's, uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, that's, I'll, I'll leave it right there. <laughs> no, I could talk about nature versus nurture all day long. Um, and yeah. I think because of my career, you know, so often at dinner parties, I now have friends who have kids, right? I'm out to dinner with a friend or grabbing coffee with a friend or at, a, at dinner with a couple of different people. And because of my career, people will say, you know, my first kid was just born. My second kid was just born. How do I not mess them up? What do I do to make sure that I don't have the same thing that my parents did to me or that I have a better that you know the siblings have a good relationship? I get so many questions about parenting and that question of nature versus nurture. Wait, do you have an answer for this cuz I'd love to hear it. Yeah, so my number one piece of advice is family dinner four nights a week. So four nights a week if you sit with your children at the dinner table, eat dinner, everyone has to be eating and you have to talk about life and not school or accomplishments. So four nights a week, every family member has to be at a dinner table consuming food, talking about things that are not just accomplishment-based or asking questions like, how was school? What did you get on the math test? Talking about the world, talking about their feelings, talking about 
even just the weather. Um, that is the number one thing that impacts how a child feels as they grow up, and it is the number one thing you can do to protect your children. And, and what is the science behind that? Is it just this feeling of stability? Is it um, yeah. good habits, uh, predictability? Yeah, stability, predictability, but also it's that quality time piece. It's the easiest time of day to get quality time with your children. It's a huge luxury, by the way, to have two parents home for dinner, to be able to sit down and have dinner together. That's a luxury, right? And so I think we have to first acknowledge that. So if you can do that, acknowledging that it's a luxury and this time together is really precious and sacred, but especially in this world where parents and kids are so often on their phones um, or disconnected from their bodies, it forces them to sit there, be present, be engaged and to spend quality time together, which helps kids as they develop their sense of resilience. Yeah, I love that advice. I would co-sign that. I think speaking from my own experience, uh, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. And I think the eating part, if I'm reading into it, has a lot to do with what I'm about to say, which is some of the most meaningful, personal, connected conversations I have with my kids happen when it's totally unplanned and there's like a dis I don't want to say distraction but like there's other activities that are happening which take the focus off of we're having a talk right now or I'm actually uh, in, you know I, I'm, I'm concerned about your life and I want to ask more meaningful questions the, the food you know we're just breaking bread and so it sort of doesn't make it as formal perhaps yeah and I've had the, like the most success with those conversations, you know, like on a bike ride, yep. or tossing a frisbee around, or uh, talking to them in at night and just chilling out, listen to music or a podcast or something. And like those, it just, uh, the dinner table is a great opportunity for those conversations to happen organically without a script. Yeah. I had a mom share with me once, she was like, Carter, help me understand why my best time with my daughter is when we're in the car on a road trip, we stop and get takeout and we're both eating. That's when we have yes. our best conversations. And if you think about it, it makes sense, right? The phones are down, you're in the car, you're eating, and suddenly there's you're present in your body. Like you're actually physically like sitting in an enclosed space with each other. And I think that's what family dinners allow as well. To take it one step further, so a lot of people who watch this show, they're founders, uh, they're entrepreneurs, they're small business peeps. And I've heard from so many of my peers in the space, like some of my best ideas happen in the shower. Like when there's just like, it's kind of the white noise of the water running, or maybe it's the therapeutic feeling. Like water is sort of like liquid sleep sometimes. It like refreshes you, it renews you. And then you're not thinking about anything. And then all of a sudden these great ideas come. And uh, so it's sort of like the same idea, unplanned, spontaneous opportunities. Your phone is down probably. You're not focused on anything else except just being in that moment and then magic happens. I completely agree. My number one time is when I'm in the car and the rule that I've created for myself is that I don't turn on music or a podcast oh, okay. or something like that and I drive in silence. And it is the time that I have the clearest thoughts that I'm able to really just, it's like the shower, right? There's something about that noise of driving. You're concentrating on something, but you're also able to just let your thoughts flow. Uh, I really value my, my alone car time. I like where this is going. This conversation has been great. Um, Would you kick me off right now, Brian, if it wasn't good? Would you say, all right, we're done? This is boring. No, I, I just, I'm just expressing that um, to let you know that I really like what you're saying so far. <laughs> it's, I don't know. I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes it's just, uh, I don't know, sometimes it can be hard to, to read the room and you don't know if you're saying the right thing, but I just want to reinforce and reinstate that this is, this is good stuff. This is not my comfort zone, and uh, doing things like this is not where I feel most comfortable. No, and especially over uh -oh. Zoom, it feels so weird, right? Like, I wish I could just be sitting with you, drinking, having coffee, but that I have to see myself while we're doing it. It's that added bizarre element, right? Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. I wish I could have been there. I, there were some plans to, to be out there in New York, but, but the, the timing just didn't line up. All good. I don't want to just um, zoom by this traumatic life experience that you had, but I also want to tread lightly uh, out of respect because 
I mean, I can try my best to empathize, but I just, I can't imagine, when you talk about trauma, little T or big T, this is a big T issue. So maybe you can help me navigate this space and talk about it in term, in the context of, like, how did it, how did it help you become who you are now? Like, how did you, how did you flip the script on being a victim and turn that into being this thriving survivor, you know, boss, starting this company, and really making a difference in the lives of so many people? Yeah. You know, it was a journey, right? It wasn't overnight. Um, I think back to being that 14-year-old girl just in so much pain and so much fear. But my biggest feeling was that feeling of being alone, feeling like no one else understood me, feeling like I was never going to feel whole or okay again. Yeah. Well, what did your parents say? Were you able to talk to them about it? No. Um, I mean, my parents knew that I was really just struggling. I think they were really confused. Oh, so they didn't know what happened? Did not know. Um, and, and we had a really close relationship, right? So, like, it wasn't because they didn't, uh, they didn't try. Um, I was really closed off with them and really closed off with everyone. And I think back to, you know, really what made the difference and how I was able to become the person I am today, um, which, you know, you heard in the beginning, I've always been a fighter. Right? I've never been a wallflower. And I remember my mom, when I was really struggling, when I was like 16, said to me, she was like, you know, I, I, she was like sh almost shaking me. She was like, where's my daughter? Where's the fighter? Like, where is that girl that I know wants to advocate for herself and for everyone? And that was actually the hardest piece that I lost in the beginning. And through my healing journey, I'm so grateful that I have that fight back in me. Yeah. Um, you know, I went to this incredible residential treatment center when I was 17. It was a program actually out in California near you called Newport Academy. When I went there, it was brand new. I was the second patient ever. And it was after two and a half years of, you know, really struggling with depression, anxiety, passive suicidal ideation, just not feeling totally hopeless. And the program was created for girls like me who had intact, loving, supportive families um, who if nurture was enough, <laughs> they probably wouldn't have been there, right? Um, and that it had life circumstances, that had things that happened to them or had genetic factors, had been bullied. I mean, I met so many different people from so many different walks of life in this residential treatment center. And for me, that was ultimately like really what healed me. I was with five other girls living in a house for 45 days straight. And we all started to talk about our life stories. And I remember my roommate too had her own experience with sexual trauma. She was telling me about it. And it was this moment of me being like, okay, I'm not alone, right? There's someone else who's been through something similar, who on the outside looked like me, I thought she was really pretty. I thought she was really cool. Superficially, it made me feel like, okay, you know, if she's been through this, I'm okay. It's okay that I went through right. this too. And then on that deeper right. emotional level, as I got to, she was my roommate, right? Like we talked all the time. And I had such tremendous respect for her that it helped me to start to respect myself. The four other girls that lived in the house, they all also had some sort of trauma. And as we shared our traumas and processed our traumas together in an environment with people that were so similar, it helped me to recover. Um, and you know, a lot of people who struggle with mental health issues and specifically with PTSD from a big T trauma will talk about how they're in recovery, right? Or it's something that they continue to struggle with. For me, that's not the case. I've not had any symptoms of PTSD since I left residential treatment when I was 17 years old. And that is really a miracle. That does not happen. Um, yeah. And I left and I went back to high school uh, senior at a brand new high school. I started at a new school. And everyone I met, Brian, I told that story to. It did not make me the most popular. People really thought I was like kind of weird. Like, why is she telling me about her childhood trauma, right? Like, how is this an opening line in a conversation? But I wanted everyone to know that if they struggled, there was help. And let me tell you about how amazing the help is that exists out there. And it really became my identity, was that I was this person who I wanted other people to know um, could get, that they could get well too. 
Uh, so much so that after I graduated from my senior year of high school, I reached back out to the founder of the treatment center and asked him if I could come and intern for him. At the time, it was still a small six bed home out in California. Uh, and I subsequently spent the next 11 years working along his side, growing it from this small residential treatment center into really what's known today as the leading provider of residential treatment services for adolescents and young adults. Good for you. I mean, for taking control back of your life. I, I can only imagine that that sort of experience, you feel a loss of control and a thousand other emotions, but like good for you for taking back control. And that's, that's amazing. Yeah, thank you. And listen, you know, we all still struggle, right? Like there's still, maybe I'm not, I don't have like, I don't have flashbacks from that specific experience, but I certainly throughout my life have struggled. And the beautiful piece is that as my anxiety or, you know, as a first time founder, talk about imposter syndrome, right? I'm like, I'm a total fraud. I can't believe I'm doing this and trying to help people. I'm not even a clinician, like, uh-oh. And the beautiful piece is that in those moments, I know always that help exists. It's just about me finding the right person. So whether my stomach hurts, yeah. my ear hurts, or I have you know, anxiety or depression or any sort of feeling, I always know that that is temporary and that help exists. And I can, if I find the right person, I will be able to help myself get better. And that is the biggest yeah. gift of all of this. Speaking from your experience, why don't you think, why didn't you tell your parents um, were, were you feeling, was it fear or were you ashamed? Shame, fear. Um, Put the blame on yourself, like you allowed this to happen? Or did you go there in your mind? Like, and I'm just saying this, I'm saying this for other people too who might have their own trauma and they can watch this and maybe take a page from your playbook because I, I think that that happens a lot. I think that we, I don't know, I don't know what kind of psychological, uh, there must be, a reason for it that we we blame ourselves it's it's totally it's completely normal and unfortunately happens a lot to specifically um like victims of sexual trauma you know for me i was at a concert i was underage drinking right i had a sip of someone else's drink and of course i went back to had i not had a sip of someone else's drink had i not been underage drinking i would not have gotten myself into this situation but I think that, you know, instead of, and I spent a lot of time in that place, right? What I learned well, though, well, hold on a yeah. Second. Well, let me just say, in your defense, you know, if I step out the door today and I get run over by a bus, uh, I could say the same thing. Well, if I wouldn't have stepped out at, you know, 12.28 p.m. and the bus hadn't have been coming around the corner at 75 miles an hour, I mean, that's just ridiculous um, that we... I know that now. Yeah. And I know when, and I've had other bad things happen in my life, right? And again, I think part of that learning process is not taking blame. And when you blame yourself, ultimately that leads to shame, right? And if you get out of that blame shame cycle and instead, you know, I really live my life and so much of my life in solution, right? Of like, how do we get to that solution? Uh, so much so that sometimes it can be a little difficult. My friends will get frustrated with me. They're like, can we just spend a minute being really sad and spend a minute being like, okay, I hate myself, whatever. But my, my personality is so solution oriented because again, like I know help exists for everyone, for everything. And we just have to get you in the room. Once you're in the room, healing is possible. My guess is in your... Know, Psychology is super interesting to me. Uh, I know enough to be dangerous, but my guess is, and speaking from my own little T, my little traumas that I've had over my life, uh, adversity, it, it can fall on either side of the fence. Either it punches you in the mouth and you get knocked out and you don't get up, it defeats you, or when you get slugged, you wipe the blood off, you spit it out and you stand up and you start fighting again. But in my experience, it's like, I don't, I have this feeling that I don't ever want that to win or defeat me. And so it's like, if I've had a, 
a really bad experience, I like my defense mechanism works in the other direction and suddenly like I want to be super positive about it. So I can relate with those feelings of, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll be sad for a minute, maybe a few seconds. And then I'm like, all right, it's time to like brush myself off, spit the blood out and like just keep keep going because this is not going to get the best of me. So it's funny in now in my work at Charlie Health with my team, if we're ever on a call and someone on a call says no, insults what we do, something, everyone starts laughing right away. And they're like, oh, here comes Carter. Let's go. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of Charlie Health in the beginning was convincing specifically insurance companies, payers, convincing parents that what we do could work and could be as good as in-person treatment. And every time someone would, you know, an insurance company or someone would like push back a little bit and say like, let's schedule another call. I'm not really sure about this. My team would walk out of the meeting just laughing. It would be like, let's go, Carter. We all know where this is going. Like, okay, it's, it's you know, the new war. We now have a new person to fight. So I get that now. Um, I love being told no now because it really inspires me. Uh, tell me no and there's like a 0% chance I'm not going to come back. <laughs> I'm not going to come back like yeah. blazing, guns are blazing. Let's fight this. Yeah. No, I, I again, relatable. I, I know that feeling. So tell people, I'm assuming the gap in the story here is that you spent 11 years helping to build that business in Newport. You worked side by side with the caregivers, really learning the craft, honing, you know, what it was that you wanted to do. And then so fill in the rest of the story from you know, after that 11 year. Well, so the amazing part during that journey was that I got to experience on a daily basis. You know, I knew my story. I knew treatment had worked for me, but I got to experience on a daily basis, other people recovering, other people who were going through the treatment process and were getting better. What was the treatment? Was it talk therapy? Was it group therapy? Was it? So the residential treatment center was a mix of a bunch of different types of treatment. Uh, I used to say to parents that it was like we would throw spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks at the residential treatment center. Expose them to all different types of therapeutic practices, both CBT, DBT, experiential therapies. We had horses, we had you know all different sorts of things. How can we get you connected into your body so that we can do that deep, deep work that we all know is needed in order to recover and to recover from any sort of mental illness? Um, and so over my 11 years there, you know, I was a part of thousands of families recovery journeys. I have a box that I keep. Um, I have one in my car and then one on my bedside table at home of thank you letters from families who would reach out to me, you know, a month, a year, five years later and share with me how their child was now doing or share with me how they were doing. Uh, and you know, right before I actually got on here, I just got a call from someone who I worked with nine years ago, and she just told me that she just got into some school for her master's degree, and she just wanted oh, to call cool. and say thank you. And, you know, I, it was such a beautiful experience being able to work with these families and creating a program that truly worked. What you hear so often in mental health treatment is that, you know, you can't measure the efficacy of a program because it's the mind and we don't understand the human brain. And who knows if this will work, may as well try it. Or you heard about people who would go to rehab five times, eight times, 10 times. I think now the average time that people go into residential treatment um, for primary mental health or co-occurring issues is six times in residential treatment. So the industry was telling people that residential treatment didn't work, that treatment didn't exist, and yet I got to see every day that true treatment did exist and it could help people recover, that evidence-based care worked. And that was my biggest takeaway. And you know, a few years ago, I decided that I wanted to build something that was more accessible because residential treatment, while it's an amazing thing, um, is only available to 1% of the population. And what we know is that somewhere between 10 to 15 million kids struggle every single year with some sort of acute behavioral health issue. And 90% of them don't have access to even once a week therapy or any sort of evidence-based care that would help them recover. And so no matter how many residential treatment centers we built, we were never gonna be able to have enough beds for the number of kids that really need access to care. 
And so my mission was to create something that was accessible and affordable and produce the same type of treatment outcomes. So incorporated evidence-based practices. And then also remember how I told you about how I was in this house with five other girls and that those girls were similar to me and that connection really helped me. I wanted to create a program that paired people together based on their shared experiences. And that's what we've built at Charlie Health. It's the first program that pairs people together based on their age, their primary diagnosis, their secondary diagnosis, but then also their maladaptive coping mechanisms, as well as their preferences. So we have groups of six 16-year-old girls who have purple hair, who have sexual trauma, and love cosplay. And we get to put them together for an intensive therapeutic experience because we're able to work with thousands of kids at the same exact time and figure out the best possible cohort for them, which is the piece that just gets me so excited that I can really show people within 24 hours of entering into our program that they're not alone and that there are other people who are just like them. They may not live in their same small town. You know, we launched Charlie Health in Montana, total population of a million. Um, and in these small communities, we would have kids who would come to us who had never met someone who had attempted suicide before. And yet they had had five suicide attempts. They were the only one in their high school that, were, that was struggling with suicidal ideation and didn't realize that there were other people like them in the world. And being able to introduce those kids to other people like them and then infuse that group experience with evidence-based practices and expose them to clinicians that, again, in their small town, they might not have a clinician that specializes in DBT. They might not have a clinician that specializes in EMDR. And we're able to pair them with that specific clinician whose entire career has been spent focusing on whatever their primary and secondary mental health issues are. Mm -hmm. uh, so what's the model? How does it work? Is it is it all remote? 100% virtual treatment. And every patient who comes to us is given an initial assessment within 24 hours of the first phone call. Um, and after that initial assessment, we design a treatment plan for them. Typically, that treatment plan exists consists of three days a week, group therapy, and then one individual therapy session and one family therapy session. That's at the highest level of our program, um, the most intensity. And then from there, we're able to adapt based on what that individual needs. So the customization, the personalization, uh, this sounds really cost prohibitive. Is it expensive? Great question. So that was the second piece. So I wanted treatment to be accessible and for people to be able to actually access care. By the way, one thing we didn't talk about was how far typically patients drive to intensive outpatient treatment. Intensive treatment typically is about 95 minutes from a patient's home. And so if you're a working parent to drive your kid there three times per week, then wait three hours while they're in group therapy and then drive them back home, uh, doesn't end up usually happening, right? Uh, because it's prohibitive. It doesn't make sense for most families. So the accessibility piece was that I wanted to be virtually accessible so people could own their treatment experience. So the 12 year old girl in rural Montana could own her treatment experience and log it on her own. And I did not believe that her treatment should be determined based on her parents' finances. And so from day one, we have created this model of insurance agnostic treatment, payer agnostic treatment creating a treatment model that is accessible for all, which means that we're in network with all major insurances. When we launched in Montana, um, we spent the first year advocating, fighting day in, day out. And today I'm proud to say that if you call us and you live anywhere in the state and you have any type of insurance, we are in network with all insurance providers, including Medicaid. And the same is true in 20 other states. So impressive. How did you do that, Carter? I mean, that's almost seems like Mount Everest. So I would say it was almost like Mount Everest we all at least know exists and that people have climbed it. Uh, I'm going to go a step further. Everyone told me it was impossible, that it could not happen. So it was like the first person climbing Mount Everest, right? Uh, that there was no way that you could get a program that was going to be covered by both Medicaid as well as commercial payers. Uh, and that's, you know, I think how my team uh, really got started to think of me as the fighter. Because the second someone would tell me that that was going to be impossible, my first thought was just game on, let's do it. Um, and it took a lot of work. 
and it took a lot of conversations. We partnered um, with several different research institutes so that we could demonstrate the efficacy of our program. We invested a lot of time and energy and resources up front in measuring the outcomes of our program so that we could actually go in and meet with payers and explain to them why we're doing what we do, how we do what we do, and what we needed in order to be able to provide care to their members. Okay, so I'm also just doing the math. Forgive me. Um, and then you finished high school, and then you worked for 11 years in Newport, which brings us to you know 28, 29 years old. Uh, is this your first company? It, Charlie Health is. It's, I'm a first-time founder. So. <laughs> so I worked for I mean, Newport all... for 11 years, and then yeah, left yeah. Newport and joined Charlie Health. I mean, nothing like up to the plate taking a big swing the first time out like um that's true <laughs> it's not small and then this is a private company it is yes and it must have taken an enormous amount of capital how did you do that talk to us about your fundraising like if you can mention who who else is on board to help out because this is what i would imagine a huge 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 undertaking yeah you know, we had been working on the business plan for a long time before COVID when I was still at Newport. Um, I had this idea of what I wanted to do. And then COVID hit and I was still at Newport and was unable to leave Newport and turned to my lifetime partner uh, and said, hey, I can't leave my job, but I think you can leave yours. At the time, he was working at a hedge fund. Uh, and he left his job and he was the first employee of Charlie Health and uh, was able to go out and raise an initial round of funding to run with this idea. We knew that we had a small window with the pandemic happening to take advantage of COVID waivers and get paid right away for virtual treatment. And, right. and during that time, we were able to then advocate for these in-network contracts by showing the efficacy of our program. Um, but it was yeah. really him who went out in the beginning and told people about what we were doing to raise that, raise that initial seed round. Um, and then from there, we've raised additional funding to really contribute to our growth. It's myself, Justin, as well as our third co-founder, Dr. Caroline Finkel. Uh, she is a clinician who I actually met in an intensive outpatient program when I was 17 years old, which is crazy. And we now run the largest intensive outpatient program in the country together. Uh, pretty cool story. And she's the third co-founder and she is a total clinical weapon. Um, she's innovative, she's passionate, and she's research oriented. So from day one, she was the one who said, we must be tracking these patient outcomes to ensure that we can show just how strong our program is. Yeah, uh, that sounds like a trifecta, very strong team. Um, for other founders who are thinking about doing something similar, but in a different vertical, yeah. uh, what, what was the first series r raise? How much did you have to raise? Um, so we raised an initial seed route of $850,000. Okay, I mean, under a million dollars, that's pretty impressive that you're doing all of that with such little, little bit of funding. And we've raised additional and, funding since then. You know, yeah. for us, the big, we haven't published it, right? And it's not something that we share, Brian. And I think I, you know, it's for other founders, it's a strategic decision. It's a decision that we made to not share our funding in a world where people are constantly sharing how much they raise where people are constantly talking about their valuations. You know, how many unicorn founders have we all read about? A lot. And I, you know, I made the decision from the beginning that I did not want that to be what we were known as. And my two other co-founders and I have spent a lot of time talking about that. From a hiring standpoint, it would probably make it easier if, we, if people were able to Google Charlie Health and see how much money we've raised. But that is not what we want Charlie Health to be known as. It was a strategic decision for us to instead really spend the time um, investing in our clinical program. And we actually have a big research study that's coming out soon, stay tuned, that will be one of our first big stories that we hope can really show the depth of our work. Because right now we're kind of like the best kept secret in behavioral health. Um, not a lot of people know about us. We've kept a low profile. We haven't been, you know, 
Forbes, blah, blah, um, because we wanted to be known for being a really strong clinical program and not just a program that raised a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, good on you. I love it. I, I would I would support that. If that's your strategy, great. I think that's also a great lesson for other people to watch and see how this plays out. So are yeah, you saying Yeah, stay tuned. It could be awful advice. Other... We're still early, right? Um, what I can tell you to date is I think we have 380 employees as of today. And if you take a look at our employees on LinkedIn or ever have the opportunity to meet them, we've hired incredible people in 19 yeah. months. Uh, and that was based off of you know telling our story, telling our mission, telling our vision, and getting people excited. And we had people join for the right reasons. Hiring is the most difficult thing in any sort of uh, startup or for any first time founder. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's switch gears then a little bit and talk about the brand building. So, you know, this show is called Behind the Brand, the series I, I write about and talk about brands all the time. How did you come up with the brand name, the direction? And then maybe let's talk about brand for a minute. Yeah. So Charlie Health is named after my co-founder, Justin's best friend, whose name was Charlie, who unfortunately passed away from an accidental overdose um, shortly after college. He was someone who was, you know, again, raised from a, in a great family, had access to treatment, and yet he was living in New York City, and yet there was no program that really met his needs. He was a party guy. He liked to have fun, and he couldn't find the right treatment option. We believe that had Charlie Health existed when Charlie um, was in his young 20s, he would be alive today. And we wanted to name Charlie Health in his honor so that every single person, when they think about Charlie Health, thinks about that one person who needs a treatment program designed specifically for them. Individualized treatment seems obvious in mental health. Um, everyone should have individualized treatment. We don't talk about like individualized cancer treatment, right? Unfortunately though, in mental health, so often people are delivered a cookie cutter approach and by naming Charlie Health after him, um, and in all of our employee onboardings, we tell that story, and we ask everyone to think about who's the Charlie in their life? Who is someone who they think could have benefited from something that was individualized, that was customized for them? And every single day, we try to build our programming with that N of one in mind, that size of one specific person, and, uh, you know, I think we've done a really successful job to date, um, and it's a big part of our company ethos. Um, how we think about the brand day in, day out, again, is, I mean, thinking about who the Charlies are in our program. We're constantly sharing patient stories, and we share patient stories not just with our clinicians, but with our engineers. Everyone in our program is invited to attend a group therapy session. Um, everyone who works for us is invited to attend a group therapy session, is invited to really be on the front lines to understand the why of what we do. And if they don't have their own Charlie in their life, I have plenty that I can introduce them to um, and they can get inspired by those people. So maybe let's impart some advice to other founders or people you know who are in the trenches like you doing the good work what have you learned or maybe what's been the most surprising thing about building this brand? What have you learned? What advice could you impart? Oh, so many different things. Um, hiring is hard and figuring out from the start how you want to hire and why you want to hire certain people. I think in an incredibly competitive market, it can be easy to throw out big numbers, to throw things around, and to really figure out from the beginning who you want on your team and why you want them on your team. Also, during our first week with employees, I do a session with all of them where I ask them to write on a sticky note what their why is and put it either next to their desk or next to their computer. Um, and if someone doesn't have a why, they're not gonna be a good fit with us. You have to have some sort of inspiration, some sort of drive that gets you out of bed every morning. Um, and I think that also just orienting around that has been really helpful. 
the other thing I would say is it's really helpful to have, I happen to have two co-founders. Um, having a co-founder is incredibly helpful. It was something that, you know, the company that I worked for previously, um, I was the right hand to the CEO, but there was only one CEO and one founder. Uh, and having a co-founder is an incredible gift that I would recommend really for everyone, that they bring someone, that they find the right person to be their co-founder, um, to be in the trenches with them, uh, because it can be lonely. Um, I don't think I anticipated yeah. just how lonely parts of being a founder could be. People talk about it, um, but I, I thought I was maybe a little immune to that. Um, and um, there are certainly those like dark, lonely moments, right? Um, I also think being an empath as a founder is challenging. Um, I really think about how all my employees feel. I think about how all of our patients feel. I think about how every single person who we interact with feels. One of our core values as a company is, our three core values are connection, congruence, and commitment. And connection we define as being relationship obsessed. Being relationship obsessed though is sometimes hard. Having that deep empathy for your employees, having that deep empathy for your patients, you know, the work we do is heavy, but the work anyone does in human management is heavy. Um, you have employees who come in and share really deep, dark things with you, and you have to have a support group, a support network, people who you can go to and talk to about those things. Yeah, well, I also think too, again, speaking from my own experience, um, no one has the passion for the business like you do, especially, you know, because you have the skin in the game, you have the equity, you're one of the co-founders, and it's difficult if you have 350 people working with you, I'll say, um, to share that same vision or the same passion because they don't have the same kind of equity stake. And so, yeah, it, it can be challenging. So every other week I do employee onboarding for three, a three hour employee onboarding workshop live. It is the best thing. There is no better use of my time um, for anyone who joins the team to get to be a, to get to meet them um, and to be able to share live with them. My passion, I think, has really been beneficial in our growth. Yeah. Have you experienced any um of the typical, let's say, prejudices, maybe it's ageism, oh, she's so young, or sexism, oh, she's, you know, who, who gave you the right to start this company, you, you know? You know, I would say that it's actually probably more in my head these days. Um, I was told that a lot early in my career. Early in my career, I was told to make myself look older. You know, at 24, I was the youngest C-suite executive at a Carlisle portfolio company. Carlisle bought Newport. And I was sitting in a boardroom where I was the only female. And I was the youngest by a lot. <laughs> uh, and no one said anything, but I felt like they were thinking things. And it's that voice inside of you that I think I've had to actually focus on the most, where you look different than everyone else. And so you assume that they're thinking that, right? And that's something that I think about a lot today is how much of this is actually what people are thinking versus what I'm thinking of myself. I've been managing people for my whole, I managed, I've managed thousands of people who are much older than me. And I used to say in the initial meeting, how do you feel reporting to someone who's younger than you? I totally stopped saying that because why am I saying that? That's my own stuff, right? Like that's my own stuff that I have to work on. Um, yeah. And I've been really pleasantly surprised in this journey, specifically working with insurance companies. Insurance companies are notoriously and um, people who don't really look like me. Generally, they look more like you. And I thought it would be hard to have people take me seriously. And I've been really pleasantly surprised how the respect I've been given. And I think that's because we focus on the work that we do instead of just, you know, our own, I don't know, fears. I also, my street cred in this comes from, like, I'm the only, you know, I'm the only person who's a founder who is also like in the trenches for such a long amount of time. And I think that really helps. Um, and by just working on the front lines day in, day out for 11 years, I think it really helped me to develop um, a strong reputation. So mostly it's just me fighting myself these days, which that's exhausting, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm really glad you said that because I, I felt the same way lots of times. Um, it's, a, it's a new kind of experience now that I have a little bit more life experience, but I think it's really worth restating or underscoring what you just said, which is, 
a lot of this baggage, you know, metaphorical baggage that we're carrying around, people can't see that we're carrying it, right? And it's only when it, we bring it to other people's attention that it becomes noticeable or even a thing. And you're right. Uh, if you want to call it imposter syndrome or if you want to call it just like whatever, uh, it's probably left unsaid in, until it needs to be talked about, right? My mom used to tell me growing up, I would be really self-conscious, like going on a date or something, and I'd be like, Mom, I have this huge pimple, whatever, and she'd be like, if you don't tell them it's there, they won't see it. And I don't know if they didn't actually see it, but there was something about switching to that mindset that really worked for me. Um, so, I don't know. I think we could all benefit from that. Sometimes we like just throw out all of our insecurities. Um, we don't need to do that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, easier said than done, right? But like, yeah, definitely um, this just focus on the stuff that's important is a great message to just, you know, like there's a saying, right? I can't remember who gets credit for this quote, but like we get judged based on what we've already done, not based on what we feel capable of doing. And if you got the chops and you're 19 or 24 or 31 or 67 or 107, you know, age is just the number. You've either got the chops or you don't. And the, the proof will be, you know, in the results. So focus on the result, right? By the way, for me, I would say, you know, my one of the things that I feel really, uh, just that I'm really lucky is where I am in my career. I have a ton of energy. I've never been the smartest person in the room ever. Uh, and I hope I never am. But I'm one of the hardest workers I know. And that's something that when I walk into any room, I know I can outwork everyone. And having that confidence allows me, I think, to get over some of that fear of, OK, I haven't been there, done that before, or whatever it is. Um, I have a lot of energy and fire to keep using. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like you, you are very smart to surround yourself with the qualified team, whether it's your co-founders or the other 300 plus people that are in your community, your network, or, and on the team. So I think that's smart advice. Um, maybe my last question here is, and I'm always curious to ask this kind of question, which is, um, is there like a deeply held belief, either it's a philosophy or something that's personal that you thought was absolute you know, gospel five years ago that you no longer believe. Have you changed your mind on something significant in the last few years? So I, I had this attitude at one point in my life. I wouldn't say it was necessarily in the last five years, but eight years ago, maybe, I still felt generally very unlucky. Like I felt like I tripped a lot. I felt like I would like spill all over myself a lot, just like dumb things, little things, and then also bigger things, right? Like I wouldn't get the grade on the test or I wouldn't get whatever. And someone said to me a few years ago, like, what if you switch your mindset and just believe everything works out for Carter? Everything works out for Carter no matter what, always. And I really live my life by that today. Before I do anything, um, I will tell myself like, everything will work out for me. Everything works out for me. What I know is the reason it works out is because I make it work out, right? But just going in with that confidence, that belief is one of the biggest benefits in my life today. Uh, my team all knows that. And you know, a lot of times like we'll have a goal for the month, we'll be behind, and then we beat the goal. And they're like, nah, yet again, everything works out for Carter. Um, and it's become really like my life motto because I believe that if you walk in with that attitude of it's all gonna work out, um, you create a world in which everything does work out. And I've seen it firsthand through going from believing that I was the unlucky one, the one that had bad things happen to them their whole life, um, to instead flipping it and believing that I'm the luckiest person in the world and living in that place has really benefited me. I love, I love that. that. That's, That's super solid. solid. Also, also timeless. timeless. I can going back to college and reading some of these philosophy books, whether it's Marcus Aurelius or some of these Greek philosophers, ah, and they the taught best. the same thing about you know, basically, basically life, life is the, is the, way, the way you see it, see it the, way the way you choose to see it. it. And I think that's what you're saying is you you have the power, the control to reframe how you see your life. And I also my personal two cents on this is that. Nothing goes to waste, even though something, something bad, bad might happen. happen. Um, 
I don't believe that things are meant to happen. I, I no longer believe that. But I do believe that nothing goes to waste if I don't let it. Yeah. And, you know, one of the examples is th this traumatic experience that happened to me. It, it really has been um, such a life-changing, um, positive opportunity for growth, you know, that, that I've taken back control of instead of letting it get the best of me. And, and, and it's, it's made, made me the person, person that I'm becoming, yeah. which I'm really happy with right now. So yeah, and I, that, appreciate I mean, you that's, that's my, my whole life was my, the last, you know, it, the last over, the last decade of my life has been defined by something that really bad, seemingly bad happened. But guess what? It was the greatest gift ever, right? Like it was, I ha now have a life so beyond what I ever dreamed of prior to that and I'm able to help thousands and thousands of people and have built a team and a company that's really special and, and that gets to save lives on a daily basis, which that's what more could anyone ask for.